Chang and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, the social network is about to get a lot less social. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg says he thinks the future is a more private platform. Plus, the promise of the Green New Deal. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is making waves in Washington and beyond. We'll speak to her chief of staff about how they plan to push for change despite the opposition. And we dig into the New York City tech ecosystem as Amazon pulls out. Our investors still bullish on the Big Apple. But first to our top story, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, who has spent his career pushing for more open communication, says the future is going to be more private. In a blog post Wednesday, Zuckerberg declared that the company's future product development will be focused on encrypted and ephemeral communication. He wrote, quote, I believe the future of communication will increasingly shift to private, encrypted services where people can be confident what they say to each other stays secure and their message and content won't stick around forever. This is the future I hope we will bring about. This comes amid heightened scrutiny of Facebook's data collection practices, which are being probed by several governments around the world. Activate CEO Michael Wolf and Bloomberg Sarah Fryer joined us to give their perspective. It's a little bit about increasing that trust with users around privacy, but in my opinion, a lot of it is actually about this, the fundamental problems that are facing Facebook today, which is the public scrutiny and government scrutiny over privacy, and also the problem with content moderation. If it's, a fa if it's encrypted, Facebook can't even see what people are saying and therefore doesn't, ha doesn't have to fix it. Um, of course, Zuckerberg framed all of this as something that users want. He said users really want more private communication. It's the fastest growing aspect of our business. We are doing this because of their demand. But it's worth noting how it will affect their perception problem. Michael, can we trust Facebook to make Facebook more private? Uh, well, the, Zuckerberg talks about going from the digital town hall to the digital living room. And the challenge is, I'm not sure people do trust Facebook. The, this is, he's saying this because he recognizes there's this trust challenge. But in reality, what, what they're doing is they're talking about protecting the privacy of people in a broader conversation, but not necessarily their privacy versus Facebook, because Facebook is ultimately in the advertising business. Right, you're so, still going to be giving all your information to Facebook. Right. It, it, not only is it going to be in the platform, and, and the battleground is going to be around messaging. So if you look at Facebook controls between Messenger, WhatsApp, and Instagram, they control the majority of the messaging around the world. But that doesn't mean people who are worried about their privacy aren't going to go to other platforms like iMessage or some of the emerging platforms like Telegram and Signal. And let's not forget WeChat, which will dominate other parts. It doesn't have to stay in China. So some of the things he's doing are merely defensive, and users are going to be very skeptical about it. So, Sarah, tell us a little bit more about what he said. He said services would be opt-in, that, you know, you know, if you want your messages to disappear, maybe they will be able to disappear. We don't know what this all means, but how, how do you think this is actually going to look or, or, or feel different for a user? Well, think about the position that Facebook's in. They're being scrutinized by governments around the world who say that they don't give users enough choice. And Zuckerberg has always thought that, you know, we, if we give people choice, they probably would pick an advertising-supported network. They probably would pick to post publicly. So a lot of this maybe won't be as big of an impact on Facebook as we think. That said, he was very deliberate about explaining that everyone's been using Instagram stories and WhatsApp status, these parts of the service that only last for 24 hours. And he wants to bring that kind of disappearing nature to more of Facebook's content. So it becomes less of a permanent record of your life and more of a rotating version of you. So things can disappear maybe in three months, maybe in three years, you can decide. Michael, you've done a ton of research on digital advertising. How do you think changes like this 
you know, no matter how they are put into practice, will affect Facebook's business. F Facebook, a, a lot of what the platform allows is enables an advertiser to target very finely to find specific groups of people and to find, in some ways, their interests. And so it's not likely to affect Facebook's advertising business. In fact, it could enhance them. The broader challenge is Facebook is going to merge from being a broadcast platform, which is where a lot of the problems were. A lot of the misinformation, the, the foreign data operations took place in that broadcast surrounding and they're the saying it's going to be more private, a lot of users are going to wonder to see what happens. Ironically, Facebook began as a private platform. It was something for university students to talk to each other. And in order to become a commercial enterprise, it had to open up even more. So we have to expect this is going to be engineered and designed in a way that it will only enhance Facebook's advertising business versus impair it. Sarah, there was a new development today in terms of some of the government scrutiny. Facebook won a free on some of the disclosures in a Washington, D.C. privacy lawsuit. Um, you know, uh, the D.C. Attorney General, Carl Racine, has been suing the company, claiming that it failed to protect consumer data. This is tied to Cambridge Analytica. What does this mean? Well, Facebook has had a lot of big document leaks lately, either from governments or from news reports. Um, this is maybe a small victory in a bigger picture here. The company is going to face regulators, lawmakers, attorneys general, and this is the year that it's going to happen. And so they need to be proactive about coming up with solutions before the government comes up with solutions for them. And so I think that's how that ties into the news you hear today, where Facebook is coming out and saying, we're going to give our users more choice. We've heard them. We're listening to them. But like Michael said, I think that that's still going to be ultimately in service to their advertising business. Michael, what is your outlook on not just Facebook, but Instagram and WhatsApp and whether users are going to keep coming back? Are they just so large users really don't have a choice uh, in, when it comes to other products? Or will these privacy issues ultimately be the downfall? Uh, to already, engagement on Instagram far surpasses that on Facebook. And so there's a whole group of people who just keep coming back every day to Instagram. And to some extent, since they're younger, they're less focused on privacy. And the content that's shared on Instagram doesn't have the same level of depth as it does on Facebook. So they're, they're going to be less vulnerable. Facebook itself, we, we should expect that a lot of people are going to continue to be skeptical about it and may share less. And then you look at WhatsApp and, and Messenger, and there's really no barrier to entry. Up to, somebody can come in with a new service. Your content isn't on it. It immediately scrapes your context. And so you can get up and running on another service. So that's where Facebook may be the most vulnerable. We may see a real wet wave of social splinter in that, in, in, as a result of that. That was Activate CEO Michael Wolf and Bloomberg Sarah Fryer. Coming up, Tesla's blind side. CEO Elon Musk caught many employees by surprise when he announced the car maker would shutter most of its stores and move sales online. We will tell you what's happening behind the scenes. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. The fallout after Tesla CEO Elon Musk abruptly decides to close most of the electric car maker stores and shift to online only sales. Bloomberg has learned that many Tesla sales staff found out about the decision when they read the public blog post and were completely shocked. Bloomberg's Dana Hall discussed her reporting with us Tuesday. They were really blindsided, and I think that was made clear by the fact that the news uh, was posted, you know, publicly on a blog post, and they and they found out about it. And apparently, you know, they so they found out when the media found out. Today, I'm getting a lot of emails from people saying, "Thank you so much for writing this, uh, capturing how we felt." It just was really stunning for the staff. So the stores are already closing. You reported that there's a store in Honolulu that's closed. There's a store in Palm Spring that closed and if you call those stores it's rerouted to another location. Exactly. Yeah, our understanding was that Musk was going to be evaluating the stores, but it's very clear that the low performing stores or the stores that did not get a lot of traffic are already closed. 
Now, let's talk about the reaction from investors. You know, shares have recovered a little bit from their lows today, but you know, we spoke to one investor who sold all of his Tesla shares, an asset manager. This investor also tweeted, his name is Alex Chalakian, it pains me to say this since I really love the company, but we have sold our position in Tesla for our advisory clients. I believe that the decision to close retail stores is a bad one and points to the weakness in sales and financial strength of the company. Is that what you know? most of the negative or pessimistic investors here are telling you? Yeah, and I mean, I think it's important to notice that Alex lives in Pasadena. He owns a Tesla. He owns a Model S. I mean, he's been very pro-Tesla for a while, but I think you know, he is, a, as a manager, he is a fiduciary responsibility to his clients. And this decision to close the stores was a complete 180 from what Tesla had been saying they were planning to do if you look at all of their regulatory filings. Exactly. You know, last quarter, they opened multiple stores, including more stores than they had in any quarter in a year and a half. And in their 10K, they also touted their retail strategy. So it doesn't seem like something that Tesla was considering f for a while. It's, it certainly does seem like an, it was an abrupt decision. Exactly. And I think that's what caught investors off guard. I mean, to be clear, there is an argument to be made that Americans and people around the world are shifting most of their purchases to online. There are a lot of dealerships and startups kind of trying to help dealers with the online sales process. So it's not unreasonable that Tesla would want to experiment with online sales, but to sort of announce that they're completely shuttering most of their stores and switching to online only, that really caught people by surprise. Now, I do want to including the staff. I do want to talk about Tesla's employment worldwide. They employ almost 50,000 people and Looking at this chart in my Bloomberg, headcount has been increasing significantly year on year. But you're reporting, you know, new information that there are now dozens of jobs um, that are going to go away at the Fremont factory. Tell us the very latest in terms of just how many jobs are actually going away. Sure. So in January, Tesla did a seven percent reduction in force worldwide. Uh, and then on the call last Thursday when they announced this pivot to online sales, Musk acknowledged that they would be laying off a lot of the sales and marketing people, but hopefully shifting some of those positions to either the stores that are remaining open or to service jobs. Bloomberg's Dana Hall. We also talked about Tesla with ARK Invest CEO Kathy Wood Monday, who remains bullish on the company and thinks that Musk is misunderstood. I think the mistake people are making here is Elon is riding down a technology cost curve. So prices should fall. They're going to fall and continue to fall because battery pack system prices are coming down. But even he says making the car at this price is excruciatingly difficult. And we talked about that. We, we had a podcast with him. And yes. before the podcast, you and your colleagues yes, flew out Tasha to Fremont and, yep. and sat down with Musk in person. Yeah. And the first, he walked in, and the first thing he says is, you know, the, the traditional automakers, they are just unbelievable in terms of the way they cut costs. And what I said to him is, yeah, that's fine, but they haven't been riding down a technology cost curve for a century, right? You are about, you are riding down this battery pack system cost curve. Your prices will fall and continue to fall as theirs rise. So what he said on his last earnings call is the demand is there. People can't afford the high end prices. So he's, he's bringing prices down. But can and, Tesla afford to deliver the car at that price? Oh, yes, I think so. I think, well, uh, you, you see the restructuring he's doing. I think it's very sensible. I think he's making these moves in order to scale more quickly than he otherwise would. Because these price points are very attractive to consumers out there. So you don't have any concerns about him closing all these stores, shifting everything online so abruptly, and laying off people? I, uh, yeah, I, I, it was abrupt. Uh, we got the sense something was up because he is still competing against other uh, auto manufacturers who have their costs screwed down. But at some point, his pricing is going to drop below theirs, well below theirs, just just like uh, uh, because battery pack system costs are coming down. Uh, uh, he's got his deep learning chip, which is going to help him with autonomous vehicles. So you, uh, you know the story that we're telling. But uh, uh, we are not concerned. We're not concerned. What was your impression meeting him in person at the factory? I, you know what, um, I think people miss 
misunderstand him completely. You know, I, I just reflect upon how the clips about Joe Rogan's interview, there was one clip. No one has taken the time to listen to that. This is the interview where he smoked pot. For yeah, us. yeah. For and you're right, it was one puff. Saw. That's all people saw. No, you know, actually, sh shame on the news media for not actually delving into the Joe Rogan content and just uh, listening to... To be fair, though, you don't often see a CEO smoking pot in an interview. Yeah, I mean, that, that was provocative, fine. Mm -hmm. Fine. But there was a two-and-a-half-hour interview. There was real content there. And, and his brilliance was shining through it. So what's your outlook on demand for the Model 3, cheaper Model 3, and the Model Y? Uh, I think demand is, as prices come down, is going to be pretty explosive. Uh, on our podcast uh, and, and in our models, even before we talked to Elon about this, we believe that EV sales, as prices continue to come down, will scale from 1.3 million globally last year to 26 million in five years. And I asked Elon, what did he think about that? And he said, well, you might be off by a year or so. But yes, we are talking about exponential growth. And exponential growth happens because prices come down. This is a technology, technology cost curve. Those who follow traditional auto manufacturers haven't seen one of these for a while. They don't know how to relate to it. And they assume that cutting prices means demand isn't there. That's absolutely untrue. So what's your outlook for the rest of the FANG stocks? I mean, obviously, we've seen hundreds of billions of dollars wiped off the market caps of some of these companies. They've been rebounded. Some, you know, have different stories than others. Yeah. Where do you see the positives and the negatives? Well, uh, so you're right. They're all different stories. I don't know why we lump them into this acronym. Um, we can treat each one differently. We, we don't own Facebook uh, for the most part right now because uh, we think they've got a lot to work through in terms of privacy. I, I remember any time the regulators start going after uh, an industry or a company, we kind of pull away uh, for, for a while. Now, it is true that they, uh, they're one of the few places for online advertising, uh, as is um, Google. Uh, but now we see Amazon uh, advertising pretty aggressively. Mm -hmm. I mean, its advertising sales are screaming. And uh, I do think the whole online uh, uh, advertising market is continuing to grow very, very quickly at the expense now of television. So uh, uh, we, we, we're not worried about that. But whenever I see regulators going after a company and I see what they're trying to do with uh, blockchain technology, they probably want to get at more information on people but allow them the privacy. Uh, so, uh, so they're even trying to invest in this themselves. You think there's going to be a crypto revolution? Yes. What does that mean? Especially as, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general haven't had a great run. Well, uh, they had a great run. So they went from, uh, Bitcoin went from less than $1,000 to $20,000 in, uh, in 2017, has come back to three to $4,000. During that downturn, uh, what happened is uh, Bitcoin's share of the entire crypto asset network value or ecosystem increased. That told us that Bitcoin is the reserve currency for the crypto asset ecosystem. That's a huge role. Our, last year, $1.3 trillion worth of transactions were uh, on the Bitcoin uh, network. Why? Venezuela and B2B, business to business, in Africa, where it's just prohibitively expensive to trade from one currency into another. Uh, so B2B and the average transaction size is about $14,000. That's pretty amazing. This is, and this technology is really only 10 years old. Um, we do think there's a, a, a crypto asset uh, revolution, a blockchain revolution underway, yes. That was ARK Invest CEO Kathy Wood. Coming up, Redfin is working to close tech's gender gap, how the real estate company is creating its own pipeline of female talent. Next. And later, progressive politics. In a short time, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has taken center stage in Washington. We'll speak to her chief of staff about her agenda. This is Bloomberg.
When Bridget Frey joined real estate tech company Redfin in 2011, she was one of just a handful of female engineers. She was promoted to chief technology officer, and within a few years, women accounted for one in three of Redfin's hundreds of engineers. Under Frey, Redfin trained women with non-traditional backgrounds and even recruited women from their own marketing team for engineering roles, teaching them all how to code. Today, the company is making more money as a result of these efforts. I highlighted this story in the new afterword of my book, Brotopia, Breaking Up the Boys Club of Silicon Valley, which is out now in paperback. Redfin Chief Technology Officer Bridget Frey joined us from Seattle to discuss. One of the things that we did is look for women who were working in roles that were just adjacent to software development. So for example, someone who was in a technical marketing role. And then we used all of this training that he, we had built to teach them how to build software at Redfin. And what we found along the way is that it's just much easier to teach someone how to code than it is to teach them how to be a decent human being, someone who can work collaboratively on a team. And these women are doing really well now, and it's been this huge competitive advantage for Redfin because we're we're able to recruit engineers from pipelines that other people can't. So instead of complaining about the pipeline, you created your own pipeline. But how did you know that it was really working and that these women could then go on to be promoted and successful at the company? Yeah, so one thing that we did is we really, we measure everything. So we're a very data-driven company, and so we looked at everything about our numbers. We look at our numbers on gender diversity every time we go through a promotion cycle. We've published data on our pay gap publicly, and by looking at these numbers, we can really see the progress. We can see if people are getting stuck. We can see if we need to make adjustments to what we're doing. Now, in addition, you found that this paid off from a business perspective, and you were working on your home touring product. It, you know, had taken years yes. to get it right. It still wasn't quite right. But somehow, when you added women to the team and built a more diverse team, you ended up making an extra $30 million. How did that happen? That's right. So we'd been working for years on how to automate this process of scheduling a home tour with a Redfin agent. We'd built all this software, and we kept tweaking it and trying to make it work, but we were just finding that our real estate agents weren't adopting the software. They weren't using it. And then we assigned a new team, and it was a team that had more gender diversity. And that team, almost from day one, just took a completely different approach. They said, we're not going to build any more software. Instead, we're going to step back, and we're going to really listen to the real estate agents. We're going to spend time with them. We're going to shadow them and see how they're using the software. And this gave them a whole new set of ideas that they never would have gotten if they hadn't taken that empathetic approach. And so what we've seen at Redfin is when we build a team with people from different backgrounds, they have to listen to each other, they have to stretch more, and that means that we end up building better products for our agents and our customers. So what do you think that other companies can learn from this? Yeah, so I think that you, you, it really takes a lot of small changes to make your company more diverse and more inclusive. We've almost thought of ourselves as these diversity mechanics who are crawling over everything that we do, how we interview people, how we develop careers, even how we run meetings. And so you have to really settle in and be prepared to make a lot of small changes along the way if you want to build a more inclusive company. Now, I want to talk to you about other tech initiatives happening at Redfin. You've got your instant offer I buyer service, you've got these algorithms that everybody wants to know exactly how they work. How exactly do you decide how much uh, a home is worth? What data are you using? Yeah, so we have an incredible data set at Redfin. So we have all this information about how people are visiting our website, how they're looking at homes. But because we're a real estate brokerage, we also have real estate agents who are walking through homes with our customers. They're making offers. We know which homes are being toured and which aren't. So it gives us this very rich data set to see how people are reacting to the homes that are on the market. And what that means is that we've been able to build the most accurate online home value estimate in the industry. Coming up, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is not completely ruling out Amazon coming back to New York. We will hear from her top aide and chief of staff. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology and follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the Best of Bloomer Technology. I'm Emily Chang.
The Green New Deal is a sweeping proposal that outlines strategies and solutions to combat climate change, reduce income inequality, provide health care to all Americans, and much more. There are two resolutions for the legislation sponsored by Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts and newly elected Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York. The representative has captured the attention of the nation since she defeated a 10-term incumbent by double digits, becoming the youngest woman to ever serve in Congress. To discuss the Congresswoman's agenda, we spoke with Chief of Staff for Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Shoykat Chakrabarty from New York, Monday. She's actually presenting really new, refreshing ideas. You see her kind of week after week, month after month, present putting new options on the table, putting new ideas on the table that completely change the course of the conversation of what's politically possible. So you saw that from the Green New Deal to the marginal tax rate uh, to you know even uh, things like health care and, and uh, other progressive policies. She's really pushing the debate, and people are engaged. Turns out people in this country actually want to talk about policy. Everybody talks about her social media strategy. She's taken off on Twitter, but a lot of lawmakers use Twitter. Yeah. What makes her so special? Well, I would say again, it's the content, is the thing that people really engage with. But she's also unafraid. And she's also unafraid. And she and that's part of it. Because when you're pushing big, bold, brave ideas like she is, you've got to go at it with uh, a bit of bravery and a bit of boldness and just actually defending it. You've got to actually defend on its merits. You gotta argue it. And she uses Twitter as a platform for communication and it's two-way communication, not just one-way communication. So let's talk about the merits of the Green New Deal. Sure. There are a lot of folks who say it is just too expensive. How do you you respond to that? So th th I find that kind of a funny argument because it's really talking about a gigantic investment program. So we always talk about the Green New Deal as a mass scale economic mobilization on the scale of World War II. So, you know, there's, there's all these uh, sort of plans about decarbonizing the economy and uh, not even talking about the, the cost of inaction. If you look at the cost of action in this case, the cost of investment, um, there's examples from our history. So, you know, the interstate highway system, we spent, for every dollar we spent on an interstate highway system, we made six dollars, right? Uh, during World War II, that economic mobilization created the greatest middle class that the U.S. has ever seen. And there's, a, you know, Project Drawdown is another example. They have one version of how you could get to a fully decarbonized economy that they say is going to make about four Forty-three trillion dollars. So, you know, so you have a big upfront capital investment, but you make money. You know, companies like Amazon actually understand that. So let's talk about Amazon because yeah. she was vocal about HQ2 not coming to New York City, and some folks would say this would have created a lot of jobs for a lot of people in Queens, and now that's not happening. Sure. Is so, that a loss? Uh, so what she was vocal about was the process by which it happened. You know, the deal was sort of sprung on the community without any input, and there's a real cost. Whenever tech companies come in without community input, rents go up, people get evicted. There's an actual human cost that uh, is associated with Amazon coming in. But isn't there a cost now that those jobs won't be coming? Well, they, so Amazon is the company that chose to step away from the negotiating table. Once the community came to the table and started demanding, making their demands heard, Amazon said, no, we're not going to have it. They stepped away. Um, if we can do it through a community process, if there's a way for the community to actually engage to make their demands heard, uh, you know, I think that would have been a better way to have done that. Would you welcome Amazon back if they had a change of heart? I mean, Governor Cuomo is trying to, he's trying to backpedal. <laughs> well, we'd welcome having a process, yes. We'd welcome having a community process, but uh, I don't know where the <laughs> talks are at this stage. So let's talk about her tax proposal. Bill Gates has downplayed what he called extreme proposals. He didn't single hers out specifically, but he did tell The Verge this. I believe U.S. Ta tax rates can be more progressive. Now you finally have some politicians who are so extreme that I'd say, no, that's even beyond. You do start to create tax dodging, disincentives, an incentive to have the income show up in other countries and things. But we can be more progressive without really threatening income generation. What you have left to decide is how to spread it. Around. Yeah, so there's, there's two pieces to this. One is, if you look back in our history again, right, we've had high, our top marginal tax rate has been as high as 90%. And in the greatest periods of our growth, uh, historically, it's been much higher than it is right now. It's about 70 80%. You have economists like Paul Krugman saying that 70% is about right. You know, that's about where the top marginal tax rate should be. So she didn't just pull this number out of thin air. This is sort of what economists have been saying we need to get to to fix the rampant inequality that we have in our country right now. The second piece, if you do do a big investment program like the Green New Deal, so say you generate a whole lot of wealth, you grow the economy, you grow the pie, if all that new income is being captured by a few people at the top, uh, which is sort of what we saw in the recovery from the recession. We, we saw about, I think, 110% of new wealth up through 2012 was captured by the top 10%. 
Um, if you do that again, all you're going to do is have a few get, people get really wealthy uh, and the vast majority of people not seeing the economic benefits. So it's really necessary to set up the structures correctly so that if you do grow the pie, if you do generate wealth, you're spreading it uh, equitably. Uh this proposal would only cover a fraction of the initiatives that she has proposed. How does she plan to cover the rest? So there's all kinds of ways to pay for uh, wealth generating investments, right? And that's what the Green New Deal is talking about. So, uh, of course, you know, tax revenue could be one way, deficit spending could be one way, but we, the, it's sort of the same way that we've paid for the mass amount of wealth we generated in World War II during the New Deal, the way we paid for the, the Republican tax cuts, the way we paid for uh, getting the recovery after the recession. Um, there's examples in other countries, for example, the European Investment Bank, right? They, uh, they invest using that bank and make money back, and no one ever asks, well, how, where are you getting the money to pay for it? People understand it's wealth generating. You can pay for things when you make money back. So President Trump has settled on a new line of attack, saying that the left has embraced socialism, total government domination. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's this is the, when Republicans have no attack to make, they just start calling everything socialist. They call Medicare socialist. They call Social Security socialist. Uh, it's probably a good sign. I mean, both those things worked out well, so maybe they should keep calling everything socialist and we'll <laughs> work out. But, you know, I think the thing that's particularly um, frustrating about that is if you look at sort of the, the system of economics that we're talking about, the, the way to get something like the Green New Deal accomplished, it's so incredibly American. It's the moonshot. It's, uh, it's what Alexander Hamilton talked about, you know, with our, one of our founding fathers. So it's really more like a return to the American system than it is whatever Trump thinks it is. Does the congresswoman plan to endorse anyone in the 2020 race? <laughs> she, she plans to hear him out, for sure. Um, Do you think she'll pick a favorite? I don't know, honestly. You know, we haven't even had the first debate yet. And right now, the thing that I know she's excited about and uh, that we're excited about is we're actually seeing a debate of ideas in the Democratic primary. And I think that's so interesting. You, you often get into these personality conflicts and uh, kind of a debate of who is what. But right now, all these new ideas are coming out from, you know, Elizabeth Warren's child care policy to Bernie Sanders' free college plan. Um, and we'd love to, we, we just love that. That's Does great. she see room for center left? folks in the Democratic Party? So it depends on what center left means. If, if, uh, if by center left we're talking about people who are really out of touch where, with where the people are, because you're talking about policies like Medicare for all, 70% of the people are for Medicare for all, right? And if you look at the Democratic Party, it's close to like 90%. So the center left there should be strongly for Medicare for all, right? Um, but then if you, if you kind of have this fringe group of conservative Democrats that don't represent where the people are, uh, who aren't presenting new ideas, I mean, folks like Howard Schultz, she's not a fan of Howard Schultz because we're not hearing a single new idea from Howard Schultz. If he had an actual solution to problems we face, that'd be interesting. If you have a real solution, we're willing to debate on that. But if you don't bring any ideas to the table, then sorry. <laughs> That was Shoykat Chakrabarty, Chief of Staff for Representative Ocasio-Cortez. Coming up, Huawei's day in court. The company's CFO now knows when her extradition battle against the U.S. and Canada will officially start. We will discuss the latest next. This is Bloomberg. May 8th, that is when extradition hearings for Huawei CFO will begin. Meng Wanzhou appeared before the Supreme Court of British Columbia Wednesday, the U.S. alleging she has perpetrated espionage and bank fraud. This comes the day after it was reported that the Chinese telecom giant intends to sue the U.S. government. Huawei claims the U.S. is out of line by trying to ban its 5G networking gear. Huawei is also suing the Canadian government for allegedly violating Meng Wanzhou's constitutional rights. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie joined myself and Bloomberg Sherry Ann to discuss the latest Wednesday from Huawei headquarters in Shenzhen. This is a multi-pronged counterattack by Huawei after the pushback, of course, from the U.S. It's a pushback or a campaign, a counterattack by Huawei on the legal front, and we've outlined some of those cases there, but also on the public relations front as well. And that's why they've invited journalists down to their campus, where I am now in Shenzhen. They've opened up some of their labs. They've taken us on tours. They're trying to portray themselves as an open and transparent company, a company that operates privately, they would argue, and separate from the Chinese government. On the legal side, as you say, we have heard, of course, that they are looking, our sources tell us, that they are looking to sue the U.S. government 
over what is effectively a ban on carriers there using their equipment. And of course, we have had that case in Canada where Meng Wanzhou has sued the Canadian government for what she claims is a violation of her rights. So this is a legal push, and it's a push on the public relations side as well by Huawei, who are now trying to uh, commit themselves to uh, argue against the U.S. campaign. Of course, the U.S. trying to push its allies to push back and close out and ban some of this equipment from Huawei, saying that they pose a significant security risk. Tom, how is this whole ordeal being covered in Chinese media? Well, that's interesting. They are clearly watching this very closely indeed. They are watching the machinations around Meng Wanzhou in Canada. I think it's fair to say that there has been an outpouring of support for Huawei's CFO. Uh, of course, the flip side of that is that you have two Canadians who were jailed in Beijing in black jails or secret jails. They have had no access to lawyers. The lights are on 24-7. Uh, and they have had very little access, consular access as well. That is Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavel. Uh, and the concerns about those Canadian individuals were articulated outside the courtroom in Canada uh, just a few hours ago. Uh, in, terms of the, uh, in, in terms of what's being written in the press here, of course, they have to be very careful about how they portray this. Uh, but certainly there is sympathy for Meng Wanzhou, and there is broad public support for Huawei as well as a company, I think it's fair to say. Tom, how about U.S. allies? I mean, the U.S. government has been trying to argue that Huawei is a security risk. So how has it been perceived by U.S. allies who are being lobbied by U.S. officials? Well, this is a real conundrum, isn't it? Particularly for countries like Germany, like the Czech Republic, and like Poland, who are wrestling with these issues now. They want to have access to what is a cheap and high-performing gear from Huawei. But, of course, they want to maintain those security alliances with the US. And we heard from the likes of Mike Pompeo and, of course, Vice President Mike Pence saying that, essentially, if you were to incorporate Huawei's technology, then maybe the US wouldn't be able to do business with you, that it could affect uh, communications between the US and some of those countries. So in Europe, certainly, this debate is well underway. Countries like the UK, of course, have their own system set up with GCHQ overseeing some of Huawei's code and its hardware. Others may be looking to that as an example, but clearly the U.S. is determined to try to pressure its allies to block Huawei as much as possible. Huawei now on the counteroffensive. Coming up, New York's tech scene is growing up. Venture capital investment is ballooning. Homegrown startups are beginning to find multi-billion dollar exits. We will talk to two New York-based venture capitalists about the current climate next. This is Bloomberg. was a historic year for venture capital. According to PitchBook and the National Venture Capital Association, VC firms spent roughly $131 billion across more than 8,000 deals last year. But will that trend continue this year? First Mark Capital Managing Director Beth Ferrer joined us to discuss from New York Wednesday. At the end of last year, we saw you know, the uh, yield curve inversion and some sort of concern about slowdown. But you know, into the third, first quarter of this year, we haven't seen that slowdown. Um, you know, deals are just as competed as they were last year. Funding rounds are as big, if not bigger. Um, more deals being preempted. So, what do you um, mean by preempted? preempted? So before they go out to market, someone will come in and give them a uh, give them a term sheet or do the deal. If you take SoftBank out of the equation, is it still as robust? Um, that is a good question. Um, I think so. I think so. I mean, there. Th Funds are, there's more and more funds being being raised. They're bigger and bigger. And so while fun, while SoftBank has invested big dollars into in 2018, I think the sort of bulk of the funds increases over, over the last year or so will make up for that. Are you at all concerned about the political uncertainty tied to the economic uncertainty given the election cycle and what's going on with China? Um, so, in the private markets, and particularly venture capital and early stage venture capital, while we keep an eye on that, we don't necessarily see those trends for 
6, 12, 18 months after they hit sort of the public markets. So let's talk about the public markets. We've got Lyft on track to go out potentially, you know, in a couple of weeks. Uber, Slack, Pinterest, First Marks and Pinterest. I know you can't talk about Pinterest specifically, but what's your outlook on deals this year? So it's going to be a big year. I mean, it's, it's shaping up to be a big year in 2019 for, for IPOs. I mean, what makes me most excited as an early stage investor is at, we generally see after a wave of IPOs, a lot of innovation. So the people who are building and scaling those businesses coming out and thinking of new businesses and, and uh, starting those businesses. So I think we'll continue continue to see a bunch of innovation six to 12 months out. Now, you have an interesting background because you worked at Fab. You were the COO of Fab. Um, obviously, you're investors in Pinterest. You worked at Etsy early on, so you sort of see, have seen the best and worst of competing with <laughs> Amazon um, and, and other sort of retail giants. What do you expect to happen in the e-commerce landscape over the next year? Because it seems like we're seeing a rise of these niche players who can compete against Amazon, but you wonder for how long. Yeah. So, you know, when we're looking for companies, we're looking for those companies that are capturing the hearts and minds of their consumer. So something that's differentiated, something that, um, you know, Amazon is not quite doing right now. Um, but we are seeing a trend to investors having a, a closer eye on profitability. Mm -hmm. And sustainability, and so as are they though because Lyft is move, losing half as much money as it's making. <laughs> well, that's that's not e-commerce, right? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, but especially in the e-commerce space, mm -hmm. and where you know, scaling there there feels like there's sort of. Uh, caps on the scaling pieces of, of some of those companies, there's a little bit more of a scrutiny on that. Now, 8,000 VC deals last year. 2% of VC funding went to women-led companies last year. So of those 8,000 deals, I mean, Very few. it's a fraction. Yeah. Do you think that'll change in 2019, or is it going to take a lot longer? I hope so. I think that it might take a lot longer. Um, so what are you doing in your firm to try to make sure you are seeing more women entrepreneurs and, and, and surfacing you know, all of these people who may have been overlooked? Yep. So, um, well, one, we are spending more time sourcing. Mm -hmm. um, and also having someone like me, which you know, looks like some of those female <laughs> entrepreneurs, helps that pipeline as well. So, um, and you know, in the last year, we've increased the number of female founders that we've, we've backed. All right, so just quick 30 seconds, what are the hot trends in 2019? Where, where are you gonna be putting your money? So, um, you know, I spend a lot of time on the consumer space, but I'm also spending a lot of time on sort of the back end businesses. So think supply chain, customer service, future of work. How do we get these companies up and running and continuing to scale? And as we think about that profitability piece, making them more efficient. Well, Lyft is targeting a public valuation of $20 billion to $25 billion for its IPO based on its fast paid growth and despite mounting losses, making it one of the biggest tech public offerings on track so far this year. Eric Hippo, Managing Director of Lara Hippo, joined us Monday from New York to talk about Lyft and more. I think the existing shareholders, it gives them a path to liquidity. That's great for them, particularly the ones who came in earlier. Perhaps the drivers, uh, they're, they're being offered the ability to buy some stock, and I think that um, the business model will have to change kind of in favor of, of, of the drivers, give them more money. Uh, the company has lost $2.3 billion in the past three years, lost $900 plus million dollars last year. That's it's a that's lot. A I mean, lot they're losing money. almost half of, of what they bring in. Yeah, that's right. And it's you know the the top line is like 2.2 billion, so maybe it'll be three, four billion dollars this year. So no question, it's a good company, but it's hard to understand from the S1 uh, what the profitability model looks like uh, and what the unit economics look like in order for this company to be profitable. Investors are used to giving tech companies a pass when they're losing money, but is this an extreme amount of money to be losing proportionate to what they're bringing in? Uh, to me, it is, and and of course, we're also talking about perhaps an Uber IPO, which I think loses even more money. Mm. Um, and, so you think uh, Uber's model looks worse? Well, it's the same model, except it's bigger. <laughs> well, they have different businesses, though. They've got Uber Eats. Yeah. You know, they're more uh, penetrated in self-driving, flying cars. Yeah, all of these are investments, yeah. uh, I guess. Uh, Lyft is also into, you know, they own the city bike system here in New York, and they're, they're getting into scooters. So all of that requires, you know, a lot of capital, a lot of investments, and it's not clear wh why the core business can't make money. So where are you investing right now? 
We, we, you know, we primarily invest in New York-based companies, uh, so we reflect what New York is good at. We, uh, we have a large portfolio in direct-to-consumer commerce companies. Um, we also do a lot of, we're starting to do a lot of digital health. New York is a, is a big center for healthcare. Uh, th there's a lot of great ideas in order to simplify healthcare, give better care to people more directly, bypassing all these different kind of levels and intermediaries. Um, we, we invest in AI, we invest in automation in general. We, we kind of reflect really what New York is good at. Larry Hippo also took over Binary Capital's portfolio. This is where Justin Kalbeck um, was ousted over sexual harassment allegations. He was sort of the first investor to be exposed in Silicon Valley's Me Too movement. Why did you decide to take over their portfolio? Well, the, um, some of the LPs, some of the larger LPs of the binary funds asked us if we would take over the portfolio. We have experience in doing that because we also manage uh, and are the successor GP of two of the SoftBank early stage funds. Mm -hmm. uh, so we learned in doing that that it's, uh, it's complementary to our business. Uh, we, can, we can attach it to our back end and all of our compliance and audits and all of this. Uh, and we can, supply, we can supply a lot of support to these uh, uh, portfolio companies. Did you feel like there were any ethical issues or more that you were rescuing these companies that didn't have anything to do with this, unfortunately? Yeah, we, for the ethical issues, uh, you know, were part of the old um, LPGP relationship. Mm -hmm. None of that transferred over to the new relationship. Uh, we looked at the portfolio. We, we felt that uh, it was very complimentary. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, at least one company, Deer, uh, in common with, with Binary, a very successful company, mm -hmm. uh, growing very, very fast. Uh, so for us, it was a question, is can we add value? Can, can, we, can we really get these entrepreneurs back on track? And, 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 uh... Dia makes, how would you, would you describe it? I'm sorry? Dia. Oh, Dia is, is the leader in uh, the plus size women category. And they're killing it, right? They're killing it. It's a huge category. Uh, they're very successful. Now, what's, what are your thoughts on HQ2? Is that a huge loss for New York? I don't think long term it's a, a huge loss for New York. It's a, it's a lost opportunity. New York City, like all big urban areas, have to become tech cities. Um, and we are, you know, tech is going to replace our traditional centers of wealth, such as Wall Street or real estate. Um, and we, by, by, by losing out on the uh, capability of bringing 25,000 people, plus all of the adjacent jobs that it brings, uh, all in one, in one go uh, over years, obviously, but from one company, it's, mm -hmm. it's a big loss. New York has a thriving tech ecosystem, but still hasn't had a $10 billion tech company. Maybe that's not the right metric, but when does that happen? I, I don't know if it's going to happen. I'm not in that kind of prediction, <laughs> but, but we do have at least, at least 10 one billion dollar companies and actually qu quite oh, many I'm gonna more. I'm going to have to count them to, to and, make sure you're and, right. And many more. So uh, there's a bulge of really successful, um, well-funded companies that's, that's coming up in New York. Um, and maybe out of those will come. Um, what about WeWork? Do you think, I mean, yeah. it's a very controversial company, but. No, no, I, I, I think WeWork is a, is a great business. Uh, yes, WeWork might be the very first. Uh, you know, I don't know if they'll go public this year, maybe next year, uh, but they certainly have the, uh, the, you know, the potential of being one of those. Eric Hippo there of Lair Hippo Ventures. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. You can tune in every day. 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. And follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.